I just want to uh, sort of set up the scene and say what the kind of the outcome of this presentation, at least I would like to be and uh, what kind of the way how we are going to run it. So first of all, I would be rather more focusing on developing practical understanding or knowledge about the subject that I'm going to talk about, uh, which by the way, that's probably I should have mentioned on the previous slide, it's, it, uh, mm, uh, it will be the uh, discussion about the form factors, structure factors, and the polydispersity. Uh, and the, yes, as I said, it's, it will be more practical than rather theoretical. So I won't be going very much into the details into the map, uh, simply because I think it's quite difficult to, to do it over the Zoom and not basically seeing how people react on, the, on all these the equations that uh, you uh, present them. And once you present them, and the uh, and it's also maybe not particularly useful for the projects that you been working with, because most likely you will uh, stand on the shoulder of giants and contrib contribute from the uh, from what already been developed. Uh, so um, so then um, yeah, you can basically use this this knowledge in the more practical terms. Um, I uh, put up some questions to stimulate some thinking and keep you awake after the lunch break. And so I would appreciate if you can uh, actively participate in this presentation. And also feel free to stop me at any time. So this presentation is for you. It's not really for me. So I think you already saw this probably <laughs> twice already today. Uh, and uh, as you are well aware, the the small angle scattering experiment uh, involves the um, probing particle that it's interacting with the sample, and then we observe the uh, scattering, which is uh, then detected uh, on some detector. And um, I also assume that was uh, introduced at the either uh, Andrews or Advanced lecture, but we have the, uh, the we define usually the a scattering vector called Q, which is the difference between the incident vector, wave uh, vector, or, and, the, and the scattered one. And uh, Q is related to the scattering angle. And what we measure in the small angle scattering experiment is the intensity function. That's uh, just to uh, remind you what you probably heard already. And then when we have the actual instrument, we have the way to produce the neutrons, then uh, to go through the, all the neutron optics, uh, interact with the sample, and the, uh, we are able to detect the image on the detector. And the instrumentation part will be covered in the, I think it's the lecture after this one. So you'll definitely hear more about this. But just looking from this part, from the, from the sample to detector, what we obtain is the 2D pattern that uh, it's for the for the isotropic samples it's also isotropic and therefore it can be radially average in order to get the 1d spectra and that's what we usually get from small angle scattering we get the curve that represent uh, that represents intensity in the function of the scattering vector so now we are coming to the first question, uh, which is sort of uh, trying to get some uh, some idea what uh, what is your intuition about the experiment? As I, as I heard, uh, many of you already have experience with the different techniques, um, new different scattering techniques. So therefore, you may also know particular answer. But even if you don't know exact terms, just try to think of what components should be included in the model to explain small angle scattering data. Not necessarily SANS at this stage. It, yeah, I wrote SANS here, but I mean, it, it, at this stage, it will be also applicable to the X-ray scattering. Just sort of think in the way that you are one of these pioneers of the small angle scattering technique. You know what your sample look like and you know what the pattern that you obtain so now how to sort of couple this in the, uh, what kind of theory developed to go from this stage to, to this one? 
So I would appreciate if you open the um, chat and then uh, just type whatever comes up to your mind. So, someone mentions scattering uh, length density. There is a wavelength sample, sample geometry normalization. Okay, so yeah, if there are no more ideas, let's uh, let's go to to this one. So, scattering intensity, it can be defined with the uh, with the sort of three different terms, and um, yeah, essentially the, the we'll go through the details uh, through through, uh, through more detailed explanation about these things. But uh, in, it can be simply divided into the pre-factor, form factor, and the structure factor, and the um, and what the basically stand for is, sorry, can, by the way, everyone mute uh, themselves. Uh, it's, uh, I know it's my fault that I ask you to type, but I mean, it's, if, if you're typing and they have a microphone nearby, then That's it's my fault. Little, no worries, no worries at all. Uh, right, so uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, SLD for, for this, and that's, uh, that was very good thought about this because i mean this prefactor this first term that is mentioned here it's something that takes into account the contrast uh, and that's essentially the difference between the scattering land density of the molecule and the background uh, or the solvent that we have uh, what also it's taken into consideration is this number of particles uh, so yeah basically how much of the sample do we have so as its mass and the uh, and therefore uh, we also are not able to measure something very small from the small angle scattering because if the mass of the particle is just very small and it's not it's diluted, then of course the signal is very low. What here is represented is uh, this uh, thing uh, related to the scattering length density contrast. So that's I think you all grasp this idea because what. I, also, I think was covered by advanced in the previous uh, lecture. You the, the signal change considerably while you modify these uh, factors. So this is something that we can call prefactor. This definition, by the way, is kind of uh, loose. I would say there are different uh, ideas of how to uh, how to name it, but just for the simplicity, we can divide the uh, overall scattering intensity into these three terms and uh, I call this prefactor. The second term is the, is the form factor and that's something that represents the uh, interference of neutrons uh, scattered from the, from the different part of the same object. So this is the intra-particle interactions of the molecules that we have the, in, uh, in our sample. The next term, which is called the structure factor, that on the other hand represents the interference between the different objects. So that's uh, while the previous one was the intra-particle interaction, that's interaction between the, uh, the particles. So now the second question is, once we learned what are these three basic components, what do you think will we need to define these form factors given the fact they are um, accounting for the intra-particle interactions. So again, if you can express some thoughts on the chat, uh, I would be grateful. And if the question is not clear, then also please speak up.
okay, it's not clear. So what I'm trying to kind of uh, sense here is where you have a sample, right? I mean, and in this case, it's the spherical sample that we have this very simple illustration of. So what do you think are the parameters that you need to describe the sphere in order to define the form factor? So I know it's uh, maybe a little bit difficult in terms of the, because we don't really know what the form factor look like, but uh, what kind of the basic geometrical parameters would be in terms of the, uh, in terms of the sphere to, to describe it, to describe the, yeah. Okay, yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's going in the, in, 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 in this direction. So, the uh, the form factors uh, explaining uh, this um, in, intra particle uh, interactions or in other ways the size and shape of the particle uh, in order to define them we essentially need to know the what are the geometrical parameters of it so what we see here is the uh, are the different geometrical objects there is the um, core shell one can say there is a sphere, a cylinder, and some polymer chain. And each of these have a different, a different uh, form factor associated with. So there is a different form factor for the sphere, cylinder, and so on. And uh, in order to define them, we need to sort of basically use the formulation, which is based on the uh, on the on the simple geometrical parameters. So in terms of a sphere, uh, we uh, can define the form factor using the uh, basically radius of the sphere that it's presented here. Uh, and the uh, and the form factor uh, looks uh, like this, like presented here on this uh, on this uh, mm, on this plot. Uh, and just to give you the idea how this is developed, so um, the uh, form factor is essentially the squared scattering amplitude that for the homogeneous volume can be written uh, in this, uh, as this integral. Uh, and from here, uh, using some mathematical tricks, we can then the the, this is the trick that needs to be used, but we can derive this formula. So just to give you basically the idea how this can be derived, the form factors require the basic geometrical parameters and can describe and describe shape and size of the particle uh, that we are studying using small angle scattering. Uh, for cylinder, for example, this form factor uh, has this and can be explained using this formula, uh, which uh, involves the use of the best of functions and, uh, uh, and the angle, which is defined as the angle between the cylinder axis and the scattering vector. The uh, shape of this form factor is um, as it explained here. So the form factors very much depends on the system that you study. And as I said, it's uh, one can benefit of what been uh, developed already. And there are many fact form factors that been already developed for the different systems. Just to give you another idea, that's uh, the uh, core shell particle. That's also one of the pre presented before. Uh, and uh, again, not going very much into the details, formula can be as follow. Uh, and uh, here it's a little bit of the mixing with this prefactor because it's not that easy to kind of uh, deconvolute one from the other. But uh, the, uh, the sort of overall idea is that we can define the scattering length density and the radius of the core and, uh, uh, and the outer shell of this core shell particle in order to ob obtain the, uh, the form factor. Uh, and 
like if you go to the complicated systems and that's for example this virus particle that uh, i've been working with you can uh, uh, that can be explained as an empty core rna part the disorder protein part and the uh, and then the kind of the uh, solid rigid part uh, using the uh, atomic representation uh, then uh, one can divide uh, one can design uh, these complicated form factors and then they can uh, be explained with for example something like onion model but as i said many of this uh, and has been developed uh, already and the sort of the different group of the uh, form factors uh, that is uh, available it's the is the one for the uh, that can be calculated directly from the coordinates so some of you in the introduction mentioned that they're working with the proteins uh, and for this particular systems you usually calculate the form factors directly from the coordinates and um, here is the example for this monoclonal antibody that uh, here is uh, shown the different uh, uh, different values comparing to the experiment that's maybe not very important but what i would like to show is this formula which is called the debay formula which uh, is the which is explaining the difference between the which is uh, explaining the form factor or in this case it's already intensity with the respect to these uh, functions that takes into account the uh, distance between the each contributing scattering centers in these terms are atoms. So it's calculating the, uh, this uh, function over the difference of the different contributors uh, contributions from the, uh, from the, from the each, um, uh, each scattering atom. And the, and what uh, needs to be kind of considered here is the, is that uh, when you have many atoms, that uh, formula becoming is quite cumbersome, and therefore uh, there are um, some ways to uh, either to simplify uh, the calculations or simplify the representations of the of the proteins um, when you when you calculate this. What I would like to do now is to go to the. Um, to, to SASFU and show you how this can be practically calculated. So I will stop share this for the moment. And by the way, if you have already SASFU installed, you feel free to, uh, to join me with with uh, in, in in this uh, calculations because we will also see if <laughs> if uh, you can um, you can calculate um, if, if Satsu works properly. So the question is, do you see the screen now with uh, with Satsu? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. So so I mentioned the sphere as a as a uh, as a one of the models. Uh, that we can do. So what I what I did now, I opened Sasphere and choose Sphere from the category. Uh, and as you can see, we have a, a this is the category Sphere. So it's not essentially the model, but the I'm choosing the Sphere from the Sphere category. Uh, and what I will do now, I will hit this calculate button and then show plot. Uh, and that's we should get something that looks similar to what we already saw on the one of the slides that I showed previously. So now what I just would like to demonstrate, and as I said, if you are uh, also now playing with SAS, you can manipulate it yourself. Then what would happen if we change this radius, which is the which is the uh, this parameter? Uh, that governs the uh, the form factor for it. So if we go to the smaller radius, which is the uh, 10 angstroms, then 
what you see that this sort of characteristic bumps that are occurring been moved to towards the higher Q values, right? And that's something that you would expect in the, sort of looking through the Fourier glasses because it's kind of the re re reciprocal space and the, 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 the smaller distance uh, in the, uh, or the, the smaller distance in the actual case corresponds to the higher distance in the Q space. Uh, while if we, now go to something like the 100 angstrom, 10 nanometers. You can see here that we get this uh, rough uh, curve, which is in principle something that you sh shouldn't be seeing. I mean, not that rough. Uh, so, uh, and the reason for this is that we need to increase the number of points that are these calculations are done. So that's what I just did in this other setting. So yes, so when we had the, um, Maybe let's do it one more time. So when we had this uh, at the 50 radius, a uh, 50 angstrom radius, then um, and the uh, the uh, we had a sort of first peak here. While if we increase the uh, the radius, then this uh, first bump moves towards the low Q uh, low Q value, and um, I mentioned it already, already that many of these form factors have been analytically calculated. So just looking at this list, for example, for the cylinder, we have uh, quite a few options. Um, yes, and uh, essentially you name it. There are uh, roughly 70 form factors uh, available from SAS view uh, to, to be directly applied to your data. So let's uh, now go back to the presentation. But uh, as I said, SASV is not the, uh, SASV covers many of this, but it's ne not the, the only resource. Many, uh, many form factors uh, not necessarily being ported into SASV, but uh, if you are looking for some particular system, this might be a good reference. Uh, there is also software called SASFIT, which also uh, provides uh, some uh, additional models. Uh, and yes, and SASV uh, has uh, quite a few of them. Now, what to do if uh, everything uh, fails uh, or in the sense uh, that we don't really know what the, uh, what the, the analytical formula of the form factor is. Uh, however, we, for example, know what are the, uh, how the molecules can be explained in terms of the, uh, in terms of the coordinates. And for this, uh, Monte Carlo simulations are uh, actually a good solution. So, um, it's uh, really working well for the structures with many degrees of freedom uh, and, um, and allows for the easy sampling of the uh, different parameters uh, for the uh, either form factor and the structure factor that we just covered in the, uh, in the minute. Uh, but essentially the sort of idea for this is that we do this Monte Carlo simulations iteratively uh, sampling from the different parameters, generating some configurations uh, for the P of Q and S of Q, and then comparing it with the data. And we do this until the algorithm converges. Uh, and based on this, we can uh, estimate uh, what, the, uh, what the form and tractor factor looks like. Uh, this is just the simple uh, illustration for the sphere form factor and in order to see that we can recover the intensity and also something which is called the per distance distribution function which is something that i will talk about uh, in the next lecture on um, wednesday if i remember correctly okay so that's uh, covers the, uh, the, the form factor. And we'll switch uh, gears a bit now and uh, we'll discuss the structure factor. So now 
uh, again a question <laughs> which hopefully it's uh, uh, it's understandable uh, but um, and it's what should we consider when defining interparticle interactions so if you have uh, if you can uh, share any thoughts on this so now we are not in the regime of the sort of single sphere but what is the in how to define the introduction between spheres if please uh, share in the chat if you have uh, uh, any thoughts about this Mm -hmm. Okay, I see some questions, uh, oh, sorry, answers coming to, to this question. Uh, that's very good. Yes, I think it's a, it's a good intuition uh, that you have uh, uh, about this. So the, um, we can, for the, for the purpose of this presentation and in the, uh, in the majority of the cases, uh, say that the structure factor can be uh, calculated using this correlation function, this G of R, which is essentially the average of the normalized uh, density of the atoms uh, at, the, at the given radius or a given shell from the calculated from the center of the particle. Uh, so it's essentially corresponding to the density and packing of the, uh, and, the and the interaction uh, of the of the atoms uh, and uh, for the diluted system the g of r functions can be represented as the uh, as a sort of the um, uh, what do you say st step function uh, however for the for the concentrating systems it's uh, it, it it gets shapes that it's uh, uh, with the maximum and then uh, slowly uh, decaying However, for the ordered systems, that uh, looks more like this uh, with this periodic uh, peaks. Uh, and uh, if you've been working with the fraction data, you may be kind of familiar with this formulation because uh, what I think in the diffraction is something which is uh, referred usually as the lattice factor that is uh, related to this G of R. Nevertheless, the uh, sort of what uh, we are getting from here is the uh, this uh, when we calculate this uh, structure factors from this different G of R for the diluted system we get the S of Q uh, the structure factors equals to one, which if you recall this uh, formula here, that means that in the dilute diluted regime we essentially uh, have to only take into account the pre factor and the and the form factor. We can uh, assume that the, our S of Q is equals one, and therefore we don't need to take it explicitly into consideration. However, for the uh, for the uh, for the for the concentrated systems, that's not really the case, and therefore it uh, it has to be taken uh, taken into account. It's similar in the uh, for the uh, for for the ordered systems. Uh, however, uh, they are not really of the uh, of the topic of uh, today's presentation because they are this regime is typically not covered by SAS. So, uh, uh, excuse me, what did you uh, what was GR? I missed the. Uh, what did you say that this GR? What it shows? Oh, so, so the so what I was showing here is the relation between G of R and S of Q, right? Yes. So, what is G of R? What is G of R? That's the uh, that's the correlation function, which is the uh, representing the average of the normalized density of atoms. Um, yeah, I guess I don't really have a good illustration uh, of this, but I mean that's essentially um, one can think about the packing of of the uh, of of these atoms in the um, in the in the shell. 
yeah. that makes sense. So essentially, that's uh, that's kind of related to the interaction potential between the uh, between the atoms. So yeah. then uh, we should calculate that before we put it in this. I will, I will I will cover this because I mean the uh, the this s of q calculated from this. There are also sort of in SAS view there are four different models to choose from, and the uh, and you also can kind of apply them directly to the data. If okay, this answers this question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so so as I said, there are uh, there are four different ways to uh, in SAS view, not, not in general, because in general there can be more uh, S of Q. But uh, just for the for the simplicity, let's discuss these four different options. Uh, and the um, and the sort of the simplest one, it's called the hard sphere, uh, which enables the calculation of the structure factors from the spherical particles in solution uh, through the hard sphere interaction. So it's essentially assuming that we have the excluded volume, and then we have the uh, and then we can account for the uh, for the interaction between them as a rigid object. So, and that's usually quite a good uh, approximation for the uh, for the proteins um, and other uh, nanoparticles. It can also be, uh, to large extent, used for the um, for the objects that are freely rotating, and therefore they are occupying the volume as sort of defined as the, as the effective radius. So if you, for example, have the cylinder that it's freely rotating, that's taking up uh, the volume, which is the larger than the volume of the cylinder itself. But uh, one can also uh, apply these approximations, uh, hard sphere approximation to these cases. What is really kind of important here is that the when we just calculate this um, S of Q using this hard sphere model, that as you can see, the intensity in the in the low Q region is uh, uh, is at minimum, and then it's uh, then it's increasing, uh, which is kind of the opposite from what you uh, learned about the uh, form factors, which uh, which uh, always have the intensity. Uh, higher intensity in the in the low Q region. So when you apply this to the data, and then this will see in the uh, in the minute, then the you should expect the overall intensity uh, to be decreasing in this region. The sort of extension uh, of this hard sphere model to the collodial particles with charge interactions this is something. Which is called the Heiter MSA model, and um, I've been trying to get away from the from introducing the closures here because that's really the sort of the uh, way that these uh, structure factors can be derived uh, using uh, something which is called ornstein zernike equations. That I'm not going to do it. Uh, today, but uh, this MSA stands for closure, and that's the sort of mathematical way of uh, coupling together this Einstein Zernike with the GeoBar function. Uh, I guess you, if you are into this, you probably know it, uh, know uh, what I'm talking about. If uh, if not, then don't worry. That's not really important. But the the, the sort of the um, and the, the purpose of this. Uh, Potential is to enable the screened uh, Coulombic interaction between the particles, uh, and again the, uh, the 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 pattern of the S of Q calculated for this it's, uh, uh, it has the minimum in the in the low Q region. The last uh, two uh, can be sort of tackled together, as these are for the colloidal particles with narrow attractive. Um, Potential and they are both defined uh, using the square wall, uh, and there is a really technical difference, I would say, when you 
account either for the square wall or the sticky hearts here because the, they are essentially different in the way that you use this uh, closure functions. So now what I will try to do again, I will try to, uh, okay, open Sazi again and uh, let's look at our sphere that we generated before uh, and the, so just let me try to make sure, sorry, it's the, on this small screen is becoming quite clunky with the uh, with the zoom and the and SAS view at the same time, but hopefully can manage. Uh, that's the uh, these are these different structure factors. So let's uh, try to take this hard sphere potential, and as you can see here, the once this is applied, then uh, the uh, the the intensity decrease in the low Q region. Uh, sort of the similar should happen when we do the uh, this higher MSA. So yes, if you are uh, if you are now playing with that, you can take a look basically what is the effect if you apply one or the other. Coming back uh, to this one. I just want to say that um, there are different methods to include these structure factors into the calculation. Not going very much into the details of it, but uh, we essentially have uh, three different options, uh, which the, the one is called the monodispers approximation. Uh, and that's for the spherical symmetric interaction potential and it is independent of the part of the uh, particle size. Then we have a decoupling approximation uh, and that's for the applicable for the for the particles with small anisotropies uh, and the local monodispers approximation uh, and that's the uh, for the particle of certain size um, which is surrounded by the uh, by the particle with the same size. Maybe that become a little bit clearer when uh, we talk about actually polydispersity uh, in the next uh, few slides. What I what I exactly mean in in terms of the uh, in terms of the polydispersity. Uh, just um, yes, again, if you if you uh, really need, uh, then I I just want to point out that there is an option. To do this, and in SAS view, we uh, have the uh, option to include the monodisper approximation, which is uh, as a default, but also the uh, the decoupling approximation. And the way you choose this is the by choosing different terms here. Right. So now we go to the only dispersity. Whoops, that didn't work exactly the way I wanted, sorry. Hit the wrong button. Yes. Okay. So in principle, we have three types of polydispersity. We uh, can account for something which is called size polydispersity. When all particles have similar shape, but different in size. Then we have something like a shape polydispersity. So they differ in a shape, both in a shape and size. Uh, and the I will have this um, illustration on the next few slides so you can see examples for this. And then something which is referred to the conformational polydispersity, which is really like uh, for the particles that have the identical molecular mass so they kind of the same yeah the same mass essentially but they can adopt the different conformations and i didn't hear anyone mentioning the um working with the flexible proteins uh, during the introduction but i'm sorry if i missed it but that's uh, that's essentially the case so now uh 
one more question, <laughs> but uh, sorry, that absolutely last. <laughs> uh, how, how to, what, what is your feeling? How can we account for this polydispersity? So, so far we learned that we, uh, that we have the preform and structure factor and uh, they were coupled together through the different terms. Uh, so like if we were to add on the top of this, how would you think polydispersity can be accounted for? Yeah, if you have any, any thoughts, please share. If not, I will just go to the next slide and try to explain it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, um, so the, um, the, maybe not the answer that I was looking for, but the, something that, the, that mathematically can be used for the, for the including polydispersity, and that's definitely the case with the, uh, with the size polydispersity, is essentially to introduce the, uh, the, the the distribution function for this. So if we have this size polydispersity, which is illustrated here, so we have, for example, the spherical uh, particles that differ with the radius, and therefore we can say that we have a polydispersity of radius, so the, the, we have a distribution of radius of the different particles. Uh, and the... Um, uh, uh, and therefore the, the polydispersity can account for the average in intensity uh, for the population of the particles, not just a single one. And uh, as I said, the convenient way to do this is, the, is to introduce this, uh, this function. Uh, and again, in SASFU, uh, that uh, can be done through introducing the, uh, the function uh, essentially with the number of points. And here we, uh, I'm using just the Gaussian representation, which is not the, uh, not the only option, but with this, uh, you can essentially define this, um, uh, this distribution for the parameter, like if we, if we have this radius, uh, so we, there will be a mean radius here and the half uh, uh, width uh, here uh, for, the, for the Gaussian distribution. Uh, we can define the something which is called the polydispersity ratio in order to define this distribution. Uh, and the, what we get as a result is the normalized uh, intensity by the uh, average particle volume, right? Because I mean, the situation that we have now, it's the, the, the particles have a different uh, volume each, uh, and therefore we uh, have to account for the average particle volume. So that's uh, size polydispersity. Now, when it comes to the shape polydispersity, the, usually what is being done is something uh, different. So if we have this case for the proteins that they can coexist, for example, in the, uh, in the monomer and the, uh, and the dimer state, and we also have a some fraction or the data reported for the mixture. So let's say we have 20% of the monomer and 80% uh, of dimer. What one can do, one can deconvolute these fractions uh, and um, essentially account for the contributions calculated uh, from, the, uh, from the combined intensity that it's the uh, that is the um, it's it's the it's the weighted sum of the intensity calculated from this debay formula as I presented for the uh, for the calculated the proteins. So this uh, this i small i uh, k is in this case given, 
and then we have the fractions and that's kind of the purpose of this is to get the fractions um, back in order to say uh, how much contribution uh, we have of the each uh, species. Kind of the similar trick works for the for this conformational ensembles. That's the one of the protein systems um, showing the flexibility. So this part is uh, flexible. This linker uh, and the two domains. And again, one can kind of uh, do the similar uh, trick when it comes to the uh, to the inferring the fractions. Uh, the uh, yeah, the overall the problem of the uh, of the getting a lot of uh, these uh, parameters uh, out of these systems is uh, problematic in the sense that uh, usually you have quite a uh, one scattering curve and you have to deconvolute all this information. So that's a little bit of the problematic when you uh, have to account for the overfitting. Okay, uh, before I will go to summary. Just a um, very quick illustration again with SASVIEW for the polydispersity. Uh, so now let's maybe go for the simpler case. We just account for no structure factor here. Let's maybe change this. Ready is the 50 again. So that should look something like this. And now the polydispersity is the uh, is the is the option that you have here, but what it does it deactivates this this value, uh, this or this tab here. Uh, and what we can do, uh, we can define the uh, sort of the ratio of the polydispersity, uh, and uh, hopefully that that would work. But as you can see. Uh, that's uh, kind of having quite dramatic effect on the resolution of these features uh, that we can um, uh, have compared to the uh, to what happens when we have uh, no polydispersity applied. So that's a uh, kind of conceptually important uh, because. Uh, the um, kind of the we can uh, uh, by uh, not accounting or accounting properly for polydispersity, uh, we can be um, sort of working in the uh, um, we can uh, we can essentially infer the wrong model parameters. So just to sum up, uh, form factors uh, which represent the Size and shapes, uh, shape of the of the uh, of the objects. So this is the representing the interference uh, from the different parts of the same object. So intraparticle interference, structure factor represents the interference between different objects and can be accounted for using the different potentials. Um, and uh, there are three different types of the polydispersity. Um, Sometimes uh, there is also something mentioned the angular dispersity, uh, polydispersity, uh, which uh, is something related to the anisotropic uh, systems that uh, probably Elizabeth uh, will talk about when she will introduce the magnetic uh, samples and the uh, and. The, Yes, and there are different ways to uh, to account for this polydispersity depending on which type it is. What hasn't been covered in this presentation, uh, as I said from the beginning, there was uh, no, this wasn't really meant to provide a very rigorous uh, derivation either from the form and structure factors. Uh, for the structure factors particularly, there is the uh, integral equation theory and the Ornstein's learning equation, uh, that it's sort of uh, underlying basis for the developing this. That hasn't been covered. Sorry about that, but that's uh, that's quite difficult to do it. As I said, uh, uh, as an online lecture. Uh, plus, I think if you're interested into this, 
there is always possibility to, to learn more. Uh, and the um, and what I didn't really cover is also the discussion about background. So that was then something that I glossed over. But if you might have seen in the in SASU, there there was uh, some background field to fill in. So that's also important for the uh, for the data analysis. Resolution smearing that's also not being covered. These are usually instrumental. Um, uh, effects that uh, that can um, uh, contribute to the some loss of features in the in the curve. That's something that uh, to some extent will be covered at the instrumentation um, lectures. Uh, and I also didn't talk about the orientational and uh, or slash magnetic form factors. And uh, that's uh, something that um, Elizabeth uh, will be talking about tomorrow i suppose uh, and yeah and probably some more stuff that i haven't thought of uh, so just to finish off uh, the the take-home message from from this one uh, is that the uh, what we've been doing we've been essentially uh, through introducing this uh, pre-factor form factor and the structure factor introducing some model to the data. But what is important to remember is that this is the data that contains a low information content. And therefore, it's always one needs to be careful with the, uh, with the, with the fitting in order not to sort of uh, put too much emphasis on the, on the model rather than data and therefore not to overfit. But also the optimal experimental design is, is, is really key to successful data analysis. Uh, and uh, you will hear more about the instrumentation and the experimental design in the coming talks. So hopefully that, uh, that will also give you some um, understanding of what can be done with this respect. And with this, I would like to finish. and. Um, Happy to take any questions. And I saw there was one on the chat already. So Andy, uh, that's from you, I suppose. Yeah, that's me. I'm asking about the uh, structure factor for the elongated particles, like uh, like long, long rows. Right, right. OK, yeah, so uh, I uh very briefly mentioned this and sorry that wasn't clear but in principle one as i said i mean for the at least this hard sphere can if you assume that these are freely rotating the uh structure factors uh, so freely rotating molecules then you in principle can account for this as introducing the effective radius of this molecule which is like uh, taking the radius of the freely rotating uh, cylinder and therefore, in some cases, that uh, that can be used for the uh, for explaining interactions and therefore calculating the structure factor. But I'm pretty sure it's just that I'm not aware of that for the cylindrical molecules that's also been developed something specific. I don't know if this uh, answers yeah, the question. Yeah, that answer. Thank you. Okay, I will stop sure now.